dear Thomas Krüger, dear members of the European Alliance of Academies, dear friends and guests. Welcome in Berlin. Welcome in the Academie der Künste. Welcome in the fourth meeting of the European Alliance of Academies. Recently, most recently, we met in Budapest, in Madrid, and in Amsterdam. Now we are back where the European Alliance of Academies was founded just over two years ago. I would like to start by expressing my gratitude to the many members of the European Alliance of Academies. You have supported this initiative, confident that together we can establish and develop an alliance of solidarity with which we can work for the freedom of art on the basis of a democratic and just shaping of Europe. Many of you have worked in the past two years on different levels to realize our common vision. This includes participating in the preparation and implementation of the artistic call for proposals, as a result of which transnational artistic works have been created. They can be viewed on the specially developed online digital platform Loom, interweaving the arts of Europe, also on screen in the plenary hall foyer. But you can also digitally go to them. Wolfgang Kalek, whom I have seen, uh, there he is, and his team from ECCHR, together with our local partners, prepared the report Freedom of Art and Autonomy of Cultural Institutions in Hungary, which addresses the increasing violations of the freedom of art in Hungary. Based on this report, we submitted an online petition to the European Parliament and a complaint to the then UN Special Rapporteur on Cultural Rights, Karima Benoun. These submissions, in turn, were the basis of our exchange with Sabine Fahayan, chair of the European Parliament's Committee on Culture and Education. And our exchange beginning now with a new, the new UN Special Rapporteur on Cultural Rights, Alexandra Xanthaki, who will participate via video stream in tomorrow's internal meeting. We will discuss practical steps we can take to support the Hungarian artists. However, any criticism of Hungary should not make us blind to criticism of the faults of other EU countries, not least Germany. The EU is mostly about money and power politics. I would like to quote from an essay of writer and academy member Cecil Weisbrot which has been published in the journal Kultur Austausch. Cecile is also here somewhere. Right? Words, 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 says Hamlet. But for us who write, words are like fine figures, like fragile persons that we should handle with care. And because we use them every day in everyday life, without giving them a second thought, it's a challenge to turn language into literature. To move freely in writing is to open new windows, to create unexpected possibilities in a word, to ex expand the world." End of quote. Dear Cecile, thank you for contributing to the idea of the Alliance with your delicate power of words. And I look very much forward to your words this evening. Immediately after the start of the Russian war of aggression on Ukraine, the members of the European Alliance of Academies met in an emergency meeting, discussed offers of help and a joint statement. With a large majority, the European Alliance of Academies agreed on a statement 
condemning the war against Ukraine, inviting Ukrainian art academies to join us and advocating dialogue with artists in Russia and Belarus who are raising their voices against the war at great risk. The fact that this statement was possible in this form, despite partly different perspectives, I consider that a great success. It has been shown that the will of the numerous partners to work together for peace in Europe is much larger than the insistence on the correctness of one's own position. The National Academy of Arts of Ukraine has meanwhile joined our alliance and we welcome them warmly. They are here tonight, the Vice President is here. Welcome. Let's look around Europe. The Russian war of aggression on Ukraine, ongoing political, economic, and social crisis are eroding any sense of cohesion and solidarity. Far-right parties across Europe are trying to further polarize society and assert national borders. In Germany, a network of violent Reich citizens planning to overthrow democracy by force of arms has just been hopefully rooted out. In a letter to the American author Reginald Dwayne Betts, this year's Peace Prize winner of the German book trade, Sherry Sadan, wrote the following about the power of language. I quote, words count. They can forge a community together. What's more, this war, which has been ripping our country apart for eight months now, shows quite clearly that despite all the evil and violence that one person can inflict on another, and despite the desperation and darkness which sometimes obscures the view, speech is still an option to talk amongst ourselves and to converse with the world. We can speak for ourselves and explain our, plain, our pain and hopes. This, this is a right given to us at birth to use one's own voice. Language is a complex, secret magic that can save a person even under the most horrific or bitterest of circumstances. He says, as a writer, I'm used to putting my trust in language, to trust in it and nevertheless to recognize all its limitations. Like poetry, language cannot stop a war. However, it calls evil and injustice by name. With its help, we can always overcome our weaknesses and hopelessness to rise up, stand tall, and bear witness. Tonight, we will primarily be listening to personal accounts from Ukraine, Poland, and Hungary given by Olena Balun, Hanna Bilobrova, Ferenc Czinski, and Leszek Koshanovic, excuse me, my horrible pronunciation, Leszek Koshanovic, and moderated by Dominika Kasprovic. I wish to express big congratulations to Hanna Bilobrova for your courage and perseverance. Mariupolis II, the film you made with Mantas Kveradavicius that you had to complete on your own has just these days been awarded the best documentary at this year's European Film Awards. We will see some pieces of it tonight. Musician and composer Floros Floridis has created the sound environment you've been hearing outside in the foyer. Tomorrow evening, the AOA Impro Group, a group that was called into life at the founding conference in October 2020, will appear again and play for us. Many thanks for that. You have also a CD in your package with the music of last year, but this year is gonna be different. 
And last but not least, I would like to thank Thomas Krüger, President of the Federal Agency for Civic Education. Since its founding, you have supported the European Alliance of Academies, implementing on-site events in Budapest, Madrid, and Amsterdam on the subject of nationalism and art with our alliance partners. These transnational meetings are an essential component of the alliance. The Federal Agency for Civic Education has financially supported them without interfering with the content. To me, that is what true cultural support looks like. Thank you. Thomas, please take the floor. Liebe Janine Meerapfel, meine sehr verehrten Damen und Herren, liebe Freundinnen und Freunde, vielen Dank für die freundlichen Worte. Und ja, genau das ist unser Selbstverständnis. Ein zentraler Schlüssel unseres Selbstverständnisses, die Zivilgesellschaft zu unterstützen und zu fördern, die Freiheit der Kunst aber zu beachten. Und damit sind wir auch schon beim Thema. Sie haben mich hier eingeladen, um hier und heute über die Freiheit der Kunst ein paar Worte zu sagen. Aber ich frage Sie, kann man das in diesen Tagen überhaupt mit Allgemeinplätzen und Floskeln tun? Angesichts des russischen Kriegs gegen die Freiheit und die Kunst, der seit dem 24. Februar 2022 geführt wird. Lassen Sie mich deshalb anders beginnen. Die Leiche Nummer 319 im Massengrab von Isium im Gebiet Tscharkiv lag mutmaßlich einen Monat im Freien. Sie hatte zwei Schussverletzungen aus einer Makarov-Pistole, ein Tattoo am linken Arm und einen Ring am Finger, so die Ermittler. Die Leiche Nummer 319 hat einen Namen. Volodymyr Vakulenko, ein ukrainischer Schriftsteller, der in den letzten Jahren durch seine Kinderbücher bekannt geworden war. Seine Eltern und Freunde hatten sieben Monate lang nach ihm gesucht. Er wurde gefoltert, dann von russischen Soldaten ermordet, weil er ukrainisch sprach und auf ukrainisch schrieb. Das Kriegstagebuch, das Volodymyr Vakulenko in den ersten Wochen verfasst hatte, war im Kirschgarten seiner Eltern vergraben worden. Es wurde kürzlich dem Literaturmuseum Tschakiv übergeben. Glauben Sie das Unglaubliche? fragt Caroline Emke in ihrem Buch, weil das sagbar ist. Glauben Sie, meine Damen und Herren, dass im 21. Jahrhundert in Europa ein Krieg herrscht und Kriegsverbrechen ca. 1300 Kilometer von hier stattfinden? Glauben Sie, dass Schriftsteller und Dirigenten, Museumsarchivarinnen und Club, äh, Kulturclubleiterinnen sterben, weil sie das tun, was sie für nötig halten, im Heimatland zu bleiben, und zur Arbeit zu gehen, dass Regisseure, MusikerInnen, Sänger, JournalistInnen, Autoren, KünstlerInnen zur Waffe greifen, um das Recht verteidigen zu müssen, sich im eigenen Land frei zu äußern, sich frei zu entfalten und eine Zukunft zu haben. Diese Kulturschaffenden, meine Damen und Herren, kämpfen im Feld bei jedem Wetter, sie übernachten in den Schützengräben, transportieren ihre toten und verletzten KameradInnen, der Tod ist das, was mir passieren kann, schreibt der ukrainische Autor Artem Tschech, der als Soldat in der ukrainischen Armee dient. Ich zitiere, den Tod habe ich endgültig in der zweiten Nacht des Großkriegs akzeptiert. Zitat Ende. Artem Tschech und Wladimir Vakulenko sind wie viele Menschen in der Ukraine in diesem Krieg Russlands zu Zeugen der Finsternis geworden. Was aber ist mit uns? mit Kulturschaffenden, Intellektuellen, Künstlerinnen und Künstlern hier im sicheren Europa. Wie stehen wir unseren Kolleginnen und Kollegen in der Ukraine bei? Was ist mit unserer Solidarität, Empathie, Handlungsfähigkeit? Wie sieht es eigentlich mit unseren Praktiken, mit unseren eigenen Praktiken in Sachen künstlerischer Freiheit aus? Wen schließen wir aus? Wen blenden wir aus? Wen vergessen wir? 
Den russischen Krieg gegen die Ukraine, der irrsinnig, unbegreiflich und fundamental erschütternd ist, versuchen wir auf Podien, Tagungen, in künstlerischen Projekten und Diskussionen zu erklären. Wir mühen uns, die Logik der Torturen und des Verbrechens zu buchstabieren und zu begreifen. Wir sprechen häufig über den Krieg. Dabei nutzen wir oft das alte Vokabular und die Techniken der Exklusion, wenn wir über Osteuropa sprechen, obwohl wir uns das nicht gerne zugestehen möchten. Wir reproduzieren oft das imperiale Ungleichgewicht zwischen SprecherInnen und AdressatInnen, nicht selten dabei mit belehrendem Ton. Intellektuelle und Kulturschaffende profitieren von der Demokratie, von Meinungsfreiheit und dem Recht auf Aufklärung und Bildung. Sie besitzen einen gewissen Status und Ansehen in der Öffentlichkeit. Sie mischen sich in politische Debatten ein und können mit kulturellen Werken Diskussionen anstoßen. Sie tragen deshalb Verantwortung. Diese Verantwortung ist in Deutschland in Bezug auf die Ukraine und auf Osteuropa ziemlich fragil. Einige Intellektuelle und Fackelträger von angenommenen Wahrheiten übertragen ihre bisherigen Erfahrungen und Überzeugungen oft ohne sie weiter zu hinterfragen, auf die Ukraine, die sich in deutschen Köpfen stets im Schatten des russischen Imperiums befand. Sie äußern sich zu Sachverhalten, von denen sie viel zu oft, viel zu wenig Ahnung haben. Teilweise werden Wissenslücken dabei mit Meinungen, Halbwissen, Halbwahrheiten oder Behauptungen gefüllt. Doch nach Edward Said muss ein Intellektueller einen Skeptizismus vor allem für sich selbst entwickeln. Zu dieser selbstkritischen und nicht selbstreferenziellen Intellektualität möchte ich uns alle ermutigen. Wir dürfen die behauptete Unschuld des Imperiums, die gängigen Floskeln projiziert auf unseren Kanon, nicht reproduzieren und müssen deshalb neue Wissenswege gehen. Was können wir tun? Vielleicht sollten wir zunächst zuhören. Zuhören kann zu einer Art Gerechtigkeit des Augenblicks werden. Diese Gerechtigkeit schulden wir all den Kolleginnen und Kollegen, die keine Kunstwerke mehr schaffen und keine Kinderbücher mehr schreiben können. Jenen Kolleginnen und Kollegen, die für ihre Freiheit mit dem Leben bezahlt haben oder ihr Leben lang Traumata in sich tragen werden. Vielleicht haben Sie die Rede der Friedensnobelpreisträgerin aus der Ukraine, Oleksandra Matvitschuk, gehört. Erlauben Sie mir einen Satz aus dieser Rede zu zitieren, der uns an Volodymyr Wakulenko erinnert, der aber auch existenziell für uns und für Demokratinnen ist. Ich zitiere, das Leben der Menschen kann nicht als politischer Kompromiss gelten, auch nicht als intellektuell Begründeter. Vielen Dank. Dear Janine Merapfel, dear European allies and friends and dear all who are gathered here. Um, I have five points, and I must say, maybe uh, to begin with, that I didn't take uh, freedom of art uh, as freedom of um, mean, meaning, <laughs> of uh, thought, but as artistic uh, freedom. One. So here we are, coming all from different countries in Europe, some of them struggling with authoritarian governments or with a cruel war on its territory or near its borders, all of them dealing or rather not knowing how to deal with a climate crisis, with an energy supply crisis, with massive or scattered immigration. Here we are all in Berlin, looking out towards the Brandenburger Tor, which after having been a symbol of division, became a symbol of freedom, of union. 
Here we are this evening gathered in a rather privileged part of the world, which had been once the very place from which tragedy was sent off all over Europe, all over the world. In this very place, the Academie der Künste, in this city, Berlin, words as degenerate art were issued, exclusions were pronounced in this very city we are all gathered today to speak about artistic freedom. This could be a symbol, a message for hope. Two, I come from a country, France, where there is no true censure, censorship, nor repression at the time, where freedom does exist, being given part of the country's motto, liberty, equality, fraternity, but is a motto what really happens? That is another question. For my generation and the younger ones, the first real impact of a restricted freedom, the first real intrusion of state, of flow in our private lives was felt about two years ago during the COVID lockdown. All of a sudden, life had dramatically changed. We could go out each day just for one hour with a sheet of paper where the reason why we should go out had to be marked. Shopping, medical care, walking a dog, taking care of an elderly person. Of course, there had been the attacks against Charlie Hebdo, the attacks at the Bataclan. The day after, a Saturday, I remember, the streets of Paris were empty. Everyone was petrified and stayed at home listening to the news. But by Sunday, the city had already overcome fear and stupefaction. There have been other murders, other acts of terrorism since then, but how to put it? However terrifying those facts can be compared with a long enduring war, with a long enduring regime of oppression. What I mean is that I know where I am speaking from. I remember in May 1990, I was going to Poland, the country where my family came from, for the first time. Warsaw, in Warsaw, Krakow, then further on to Budapest, to Bratislava and Prague. The Berlin Wall had just fallen, and I was to ask writers, is there such a thing as a Central European culture? Does it exist no more? Has it ever existed? I had read, of course, the writers I was to meet, Tadeusz Konwitzki, Jaroslav, Marek Rimkiewicz, there was no law and justice party at the time, or Peter Esterhazy, Peter Nadas, Georgi Petri. I was looking for my way as a writer. I'm still looking for it, but differently. And I admired their manner of being political, of speaking about political events in a literary form, sometimes in a cryptic way in order to escape censorship. But then someone told me, at last we will now be able to write love stories. As in, our, as in your countries, the very love stories I despised in French literature, because I thought French writers almost never deal with important subjects as collective memory, history, tragic events lasting upon the following generations. There and then, in Eastern or Central Europe, as you wish, I learned that the most important thing is to write about what you want to write, be it a love story or a political dystopia, and never let any kind of censorship, whether coming from outside or from inside, dictate its own text. Three, there are five points. Zeitgeist, is a beautiful word. One of those German words which are said to be impossible to translate into other languages. Spirit of the times, in English, air du temps, in French, both close and far from zeitgeist. A beautiful word, but a less beautiful thing. Zeitgeist is our 
Umwelt, our environment, the space and time we are living in. In this space and time, words are circulating, a certain amount of limited words, always the same, always with the same meaning. Zeitgeist is the realm of university. You know those words, we hear them all day long, on radio, on TV. We read them every day, in newspapers, in social medias. There are words as climate change, earth warming, ecological crisis, gas, oil, war, names as Saporicha, Kersen, Odessa, words as torture, winter, bombs, mines. Those words we go on repeating while we are talking with friends, with colleagues. Those words we help unwillingly to diffuse on a larger scale, making them more and more present. Words are not only words, they convey thoughts, they induce thoughts. Sitting at our table, trying to write something. If we are writers, we are surrounded by the zeitgeist voices and the words they pronounce. Literature is the only art which has to deal with a common material language. In order to be able to write a literary text, we must get, get rid of the superficial layers of language to get access to more profound, more personal layers. It means to get rid of the servitude of the zeitgeist in order to have access to our personal thoughts and feelings and chain at our mast like Ulysses to resist the siren song. Songs. Freedom in art can only happen when you are able to silence the everyday voices, the everyday words and thoughts and images, and out of their silence reach then a new perspective, a singular point of view. But this can't be done while some overwhelming turmoil happens. When such an event happens, we can only act on autopilot because we have to react immediately as a person, possibly as a citizen. Sometimes it's about saving our lives. And even when it's not so crucial, we are first petrified. Our mind is empty, like the streets of Paris on the day after the attacks. During this moment, which can last for days or for weeks, or for months, it's impossible to write about the very event and impossible to concentrate upon something else. Impossible to go on as if nothing happened, to rebuild a kind of continuity. Something has broken in our lives and in our works, and we need courage to acknowledge our impossibility to write, to create anything of value, and we need patience to stay silent and wait. The words of literature are not meant to fill the open spaces of the book to come with the automatic sentences our smartphones suggest in their automatic corrections. Our white sheets of paper have to remain white as long as they need it in order to be filled later with new sentences, new ideas with our own voice as writers, as artists, which could only be found far from the echoes and rumors of usefulness of news and information. Staying silent, though, doesn't mean remaining passive. It means taking notes, which will perhaps build the basis for a future book, reading books written years or centuries ago by writers who felt and knew similar distresses, similar tragedies, in order to help us to get through and to land safely on the other side of the event. For art is about form. Every artist is looking for new forms, and form is not an empty shell, but a complex connection between what is said and how it is said. As Hofmannsthal once wrote, form is from Inhalt der Sinn, Sinn das Wesen der Form. Form is the meaning of content, meaning the essence of form. The search of a new form is a constant struggle to get free from traditions, 
from our own limits, from our inner prison. A freedom difficult to achieve, the opposite of ready-made thought or art, a never-ending fight. Five, in Jafar Panahi's new movie, No Bears, the filmmaker who is forbidden to travel and to shoot films settles down in a village near the Turkish border to follow the shooting of his own movie on his computer. And as he can't be on the film set, which is close but in another country, to feel nearer to it. He accepts one night to be driven to the border by his film operator. He could reach the other side. A smuggler has just sent a signal to visit the city where they are shooting, the real city, not just a simple image on his computer screen. Suddenly he asks, where is the border? Just here, under your feet, the film operator answers. In front of the filmmaker, the city lights twinkle around the dark shape of a lake. But the filmmaker turns back, goes back to the car, back to iron. Why didn't he didn't he go further? Out of fear, we think. Fear of what could happen to him, to his family, to the movie. But if we dig deeper and try to reach those profound layers which lie beyond the surface, the twinkling lights are seducing, seem to mean liberty. But couldn't they just be illusions? Returning to the village, the filmmaker chooses a difficult path, making a film without being there, his presence being only virtual, working with the media without immediacy, depending on bad internet connections and constant disruptions from the village, from the daily reality with its constant pressures. But those bad conditions create the very conditions for his artistic freedom giving birth to a new kind of cinema, mixing fiction, documentary, thematizing the opposition between still image and moving image, making immobility a symbol for censorship. Dealing with all possible constraints, Jafar Panahi, the author of the movie No Bears, and Jafar Panahi, the actor in the movie no bears, are both telling us that artistic freedom doesn't mean escaping for a time. It would be, have been just for one night into an illusory free world. And is Turkey that free? But to accept the confrontation with reality, whatever difficult and oppressive reality is. In other words, artistic freedom is acknowledging the here and now we are living in is a constant compromise with exterior conditions as artistic freedom inhabits inside of us, in our ability to distance ourselves from the daily events and language and traditions in order to find our own voice. We all know that Jafar Panahi has just been sentenced to six years imprisonment he probably felt it would be happen while working on the film, but he could complete it. And the film has been running or is now running in Venice, Paris, London, or elsewhere. His film is free. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Cecile. We had a great pleasure to listen to this very powerful statement of a person that was awarded for enhancing the cultural international relations between Germany and France, a writer, an essayist, a translator of works, among others, by Virginia Woolf. Thank you very much for that one, especially. And uh, I think there were many very powerful statements and sentences in what you have said. And the one 
I'm personally taking with me is that we that something has broken in our lives recently and we need the courage to acknowledge the impossibility to write to create and we need a patient to stay silent and silence does not mean being passive thank you very much it will be a great bridge for us and let me introduce to the stage our panelists my name is dominika kasprovic I'm a director of the Villa Desius Association, an independent NGO in Krakow, Poland. And I will be very honored to let the, this evening's panel on the topic that is so huge and so challenging. But with such great guests, I'm more than sure that we will at least try to handle it. Between repression and resistance, please the floor or the chairs are yours. Let me welcome our panelists. So, today with us is Dr. Olga Balun. Uh, sorry, Olena. Olena, forgive me. Olena Balun, have a seat. Uh, <clears throat> please do, please do have a seat. Please do have a seat. Olena Balun holds a doctoral degree in history of arts. He is a freelance curator, art historian author, some time ago also an academic teacher, and currently from April this year, a coordinator of Ukraine Air Art Aid Center. Um, we do also have with us a person that already has been called in, and I'm very happy to have you, Hanna Bilobrova, director, actress, editor, co-director of the movie that already was mentioned as a laureate movie for the documentary in um, so the Mariopolis 2. We'll have a chance to see some parts of the movie later on. Uh, we're having with us also a colleague from Poland, a guest from Poland, Professor Leszek Koczanowicz, who is not only a political scientist, a philosopher, but also a psychologist. And he deals with politics and concepts of democracy, political ethics, but also he has deep interest in culture, contemporary culture, contemporary art. A researcher in many universities, Columbia, Buffalo, Oxford, and an author of several publications. One that caught my eye, and I would recommend it to you, uh, handles the topic of anxiety and fear and culture. Last but not least, a member of the Alliance, uh, a dear, dear colleague of mine, uh, Ferenc Cinki, an author, essayist, but also a chairman, a president of the Hungarian Association of Writers, uh, with whom we had the chance to be in this alliance from the very beginning. Uh, before we start, let me express my uh, gratitude to Janine and to the colleagues from the Academy der Kunste who made our fourth meeting possible. Thank you very much for your effort. I believe that we, when you were initiating this great alliance, this great initiative two years ago, uh, probably you were not even imagining how much needed this kind of assistance and network of solidarity and support would be needed. Uh, okay, let me get to the topic and the topic of our today's debate is <coughs> artistic freedom between repression and resistance. Having such a great set of panelists uh, covering so many different topics with such a great uh, and rich expertise and experience, uh, I decided to um, focus on four topics 
So the logic of the panel will, will be as follows. If somebody of you needs a, a translation from German language to English, feel free to uh, make a good use of the headsets. They are there. And uh, we will be having uh, four sets of around approximately 10 minutes. I will be calling colleagues to uh, present a short statement and then we will be having an interaction and discussion. I hope for your questions and your comments at the end of the, of the session. Saying that I'm realizing that we are uh, now really need to speed up because we have not more than 55 minutes altogether. Uh, saying that, not to lag behind the schedule too much, saying that, I wanted to start with uh, uh, Leszek Kocanovic and um, with a very short sentence. Um, we were given the topic, artistic freedom um, between repression and resistance. We will be discussing the challenges and the practices of repression and resistance. I hope Leszek can help us out to enter this field by reflecting upon the phenomena of fear and anxiety. An interesting um, imminent elements of life, a life of individuals and life of communities. Uh, I believe that you have a lot of interesting comments also on the role of artists in this world full of fear, fear and anxiety. Leszek, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you for invitation. Thank you for this introduction. Uh, it is, of course, a uh, vast uh, topic, artistic freedom. But I would like to start with the um, question, a question which uh, was, I would say, uh, in center of the exhibition, which is uh, downstairs why oppressive regimes are so feared of art. Art is fragile, art is weak. You know, you can uh, kill artists, you can destroy books, you can destroy paintings, but anyway, each oppressive regime try to control, to destroy, to, uh, to eradicate art, which is not... Uh, uh, not sufficiently subordinated to its goal. And I am also thinking about art and democracy. One of the theoreticians of democracy said that art doesn't need democracy. Art flourished even in oppressive regime, in feudal time and so on. But democracy needs, democracy, uh, needs arts. Democracy uh, uh, don't exist without art. Art is like the air for democratic uh, society. So uh, this is the, the question, the frame I would like to, uh, to, uh, to uh, answer in this short uh, talk. Uh, I am uh, writing my book uh, is about anxiety lucidity about uh, anxiety in uh, modernity. And I would say that uh, there are uh, many insights, I hope, in this uh, book. But uh, I think that central is that uh, modernity is, I, would, I wouldn't say organized, because mod I like modernity. I think that modernity is very important in changing very positive uh, way uh, society. But the problem is that there is a shadow of modernity. And the shadow is instrument instrumentalization and domination. Technology imposed some kind of domination, some kind of instrumentalization. It is what in a philosophical term 
German philosopher Inger Habermas uh, described as a colonization of Lebenswelt, again, very difficult to translate uh, German word by system. Uh, so uh, I think that, uh, that this instrumentalization, looking only f for technological means and domination, domination uh, on uh, culture, on other people, on nations, and so on and so on, is something which is like the shadow, the, uh, the bad side of, uh, of uh, modernity. So why uh, artistic production is so important? Why artists are, are so important? I think that for democratic society and for democracy in general, it is necessary to have a kind of vision of future. Democracy, again, one of this, my favorite definition is ongoing experiment. Democracy, the, the difference between totalitarian or to authoritarian regime, and I lived in the in authoritarian regime half of my life, is that democracy provokes imagination. It is, of course, difficult. Democracy is a difficult system. And I wouldn't imagine uh, imagination without art artist. So uh, the art is something which could show alternatives, could show uh, possibility of different kind of society. And for that reason, art is so important and art is so hated by any kind of um, uh, oppressive regime. In my recent uh, work, I am trying to look at uh, how to say, culture and emancipation, culture and power. And one of my, my ideas is that even in the most totalitarian, authoritarian regime, we can find what I call niches of emancipation. The niches of emancipation don't have to have political character. It is enough. I still remember from 70s, 80s, you know, small kitchens in uh, small apartments. The kitchen which became the place of freely exchange of work. There is no uh, regime outside uh, beyond the window. And I think that uh, it is still very important. Even in democratic uh, society, there is a lot of uh, oppression, not to speak uh, in the, um, uh, not to speak uh, about this uh, terrible Russian aggression in, uh, in Ukraine. They we need this kind of resistance, this kind of uh, um, imagination which could help us to, um, uh, to survive and to uh, change. Maybe this is enough because... Thank you very much, Leszek. Uh, I think it's important that we have the kind of a framework, being aware of the challenges, but also the potentials that are within even the dark hour of, of uh, fear and anxiety. I would like to... Uh, uh, ask if you have any comments or um, uh, advotums to this part of, of our discussion, Ferenc. Well, there are so many yeah, possibilities and connections uh, uh, to what has been said uh, before. Um, and I would like to connect it somehow to our situation because I guess that's the main reason yeah. why, why we are being here. And, uh, but before all, I would like to tell you that I'm very, very uh, thankful for, for being here and for, for the Alliance, because, and, and, and not just because I'm trying to be polite. Uh, I am. But, uh, <laughs> but uh, being uh, an, an, an artist uh, born in 1982, 
all the things, all the systems were already established when I started my professional career. And everything was done for me. Bad or good, but it was done. And uh, the Alliance of Academies was the first thing in my life, uh, which I happened to be there at the very beginning. <laughs> and uh, I, I, I really hope that, that we can be successful. And I not just uh, hope it because of, for myself, but I think that because that's the only chance uh, at the moment. So thank you for everything. And I'm very happy to be here. But in the same time, I feel a bit uncomfortable uh, on the stage, and not because of the microphone and the lights, because I, I like them. It's, it's fun. Uh, but uh, in Hungary, in the Hungarian uh, propaganda media, because as you might know, almost all the, the media is owned on by the government, and there's a stereotype in the Hungarian propaganda media of the Hungarian independent intellectual complaining abroad about Hungary. Here I am. <laughs> and there's a very, very bad type of it, the one who is complaining in Berlin. That's the worst one. <laughs> uh, and I'm very happy to fulfill this <laughs> uh, position at the moment. And in the same time, there's, there's another not that funny uh, reason I'm being un a bit uncomfortable. Because uh, in my professional life, that's been going on for like, like 10 years. Uh, it's my, my second time that there is an actual war in Ukraine. And I'm still being put on the stage complaining about the situation in Hungary. So I, I cannot really explain why we can be the second lead in European news as the only country as a second lead not being bombed. So uh, it's always uh, very interesting for me that wh what is the reason that we are so interesting uh, on a European level? <laughs> and uh, I'm still thinking about it, but I had uh, like an hour before this event and I, and I took a walk and I think I figured it out. And the reason might be that you are scared because what's happening in Ukraine, they're just one step away from the European borders. And what's happening in Hungary is inside the borders. And what's happening in Hungary and what's happening sometimes in Poland as well, I think you're absolutely aware of, of this. Uh, it's a system that is using uh, the benefits of the European Union. And it uses uh, the problems or mistakes or faults of the whole system. And that means that what's happening in Hungary and Poland, or, or we can name other countries, it can come up in the Western as well. Because what's the guarantee that it will never happen to you as well? So I think that, that that's why we might be so interesting uh, in, in, in this country, and that's why we are put on the stage all, stage, uh, stage all the time. Uh, that we might be the, the, the bad example how not to do things, how not to run a country, how not to do politics. And for a while, it's fun. Like, it's, we can fulfill this, this role that we can be the bad, mis the bad example for you. Uh, but the, reason, the real reason I'm here and the real re reason I joined uh, the Alliance is that we would like to make a difference because that role was interesting, that role was fun, uh, that role was very, uh, you know, we learned a lot from it in the last 20 years but uh, we are ready to make the next step. And I think that's why we joined the Alliance and that's why I'm talking on the stage for you. Thank you very much, Ferenc. Uh, I believe so that the uh, case of uh, Ukraine and the war in Ukraine, uh, the case of Poland and uh, Hungary, this is something to be discussed uh, uh, in detail and it gives us a lot of uh, important insights 
into the downfalls of the system that has been created, as you mentioned. Um, Leszek was referring, and in his book, you would find a lot of uh, interesting um, comments and remarks on the times of fear and anxiety. Uh, when you hear it, I, I believe that everybody directly would uh, think of war in Ukraine and the atrocities that are being committed there by the Russian um, troops. But at the same time, in many countries, and as Ferenc said, we witness this quiet but very consistent political processes that are simply curtailing the, the artistic freedom. Can you, could you please tell us, a, in short, about the Hungarian situation? Well, in short, it's, it's very interesting uh, to be banned when you are still being published. It's like, like a very, very crazy situation. Uh, in Hungary, they created this, this kind of uh, semi or meta autocracy. I, I haven't come up with a good name for this, but it's like, like autocracy 2.0 or something new uh, that is based on the, the formal ones that, that, we, that we know know very well. And uh, there's a new structure. Uh, you can do whatever you want. You can say whatever you want. You are being published. You can write whatever you want. Uh, that's one part. The other part is uh, that you are not being financed. And uh, you are being financed less and less. And it, it, it leads to a, a totally different question that how art should be financed, who should be financing art, uh, the audience or, or the government, the state or, or private donors. It's a complex question. Uh, but in a small market, in a small artistic market as Hungary, uh, the state financing cannot be put out of the picture because you will not survive uh, without it. And that's what the government realized, uh, that they do not need to ban anybody. They're just creating a, a financial area, financial cir circumstances in which it is very, very hard for you to survive as an artist or, or, or as an uh, independent society, uh, uh, just, just like ours. So that's what they did with, uh, with, with the media. And now I'm referring back to the, to the very beginning where I started. Uh, they realized that, that there's no need to close down media, radios or TV stations or, or newspapers. There's no need to, to uh, shut them down if you can buy them. That's much easier and it's much democratical. You know, it's, it's capitalism. You can buy whatever you want. Uh, and you can close them down after you bought them. That's so simple. And uh, that's, what, that's what the big idea uh, the government came up with. How It's one way how they can control uh, media and culture. And by controlling media and the culture, obviously, you can control the freedom of speech. Thank you for now, Ferenc. I would love to get back to the uh, resistance, way of resistance in such a circumstances, unclear gray zone of being but not being at the same time, free to do what you want. But I wanted to now turn uh, to Olena and uh, um, to ask about the new, very extraordinary circumstances. There are extraordinary challenges. They call for special solutions. And it's very obvious that throughout Europe, European Union, but not only here, um, we are witnessing uh, the kind of unprecedented human solidarity and openness to the flow of people, but also to flow of art and creative ideas. Whom would expect that Poland being so closed up, homogeneous, xenophobic, uh, handling so far successfully, I believe, uh, so many millions of newcomers searching for safe havens or at least a temporary shelter. So saying that, I'm turning to you because 
uh, after having this very successful curatorial uh, career, you are now spending your days and nights uh, managing the humanitarian aid and uh, focusing on artists and art. Good evening, everybody. Thank you, Domenico, for this question. Well, it's actually the fact that uh, war has also changed the life of lots of directors, curators, artists, and we are in a quite challenging situation. Uh, I used to work as a curator, now I'm managing the Ukraine Art Aid Center as a coordinator, buying uh, generators and uh, different storaging materials uh, for the m museums. And at the same time, I started to work with contemporary Ukrainian artists, and it was not actually what I did before the 2022. And you asked me about some cases, about some, some artists, and I thought I will bring you some pictures of two artists, quite young artists from Ukraine. I started to work with, we were friends with one of them, I get to know another, and I'll maybe just show you some photographs and tell you about how, how it is now, and I think I'll take advantage of the translation. So maybe we could start with the first, thank you very much, with the first picture. Uh, der Krieg hat tatsächlich mein Leben verändert. Ich habe mit hauptsächlich deutschen Künstlerinnen und Künstlern als Kuratorin gearbeitet und ich war mit vielen in der Ukraine befreundet und wir haben Projekte geplant, nur wir haben sie definitiv unter anderen Umständen geplant und eine von meinen guten Bekannten und Freundinnen war Maria Kulikowska und das ist ein Bild von ihr, das ist äh, Marias abgeformter Körper in Seife. Maria ist, sie hat eine ganz tragische Geschichte, sie ist im Moment ein Double Refugee. Sie kommt aus der Krim und seit 2014, seit äh, Russland die Krim annektiert hat, ähm, darf sie die Halbinsel nicht mehr betreten. Auch aufgrund ihrer Kunst, weil äh, sie in ihrer Kunst Meinungen vertritt und Themen vertritt, die in Russland ähm, teilweise auch kriminalisiert werden. Es geht um die ähm, Stellung der Frau, um ähm, die Rechte der LGBTQ-Community und sie agiert sehr viel mit der eigenen Körperlichkeit in ihren Projekten. Und ich fange so früh an mit dieser Arbeit, also ursprünglich war dieser Abguss vom eigenen Körper so ein Memento Mori, äh, etwas sehr Poetisches. 2012, 2011, äh, diese ganzen Skulpturen wurden aufgestellt und der Verwesung ausgesetzt, unter anderem in Donetsk, in Isolatia. Das ist so ein Kulturareal gewesen. Und 2014, als sie schon in Kiew lebte, nicht mehr auf die Krim durfte, sie war auf dem Index, hat schon eine Nummer als Refugee bekommen, als äh, Russen in Donetsk einmarschiert sind, haben sie diese Skulpturen für Schießübungen genommen und sie hat davon erfahren. Ich weiß nicht, was es in einem eigentlich anrichten soll, wenn man erfährt, dass der eigene Körper als Abguss für so etwas verwendet wird und seitdem hat es aufgehört, nur poetisch zu sein. Das ist definitiv ein Memento Mori und es gibt bis heute diese Skulpturen, wo dann nach und nach Blumen Ketten, Muscheln als Erinnerung auf die Krim, wo sie seitdem nicht mehr war, dann immer wieder hineingebracht wurden. Sie macht Performances, auch mit Schießen. Vielleicht haben Sie von ballistischer Seife auch gehört. Die wird tatsächlich für die ähm, Schussübungen dann genommen, weil angeblich geht dann äh, die Kugel in die Seife so rein wie in den menschlichen Körper. Und diese Körperlichkeit hatte dann Fortsetzung in ganz vielen anderen Sachen genommen. Maria hat zum Beispiel, wo ich von LGBTQ gesprochen habe, als Performance eine Frau geheiratet. Kurz vor 2014. Man muss sagen, in der Ukraine vor 2014 gab es den Janukowitsch. Das war der Präsident, der dazu eigentlich geführt hat, seine Handlungen, dass Maidan dann irgendwann entstanden ist. Und aus dieser Performance... Dieser Heirat, die wollte einfach nur zeigen, dass es auch nicht in der Ukraine damals leicht war, eine Frau zu heiraten. Sie hatte einmal mit bürokratischen Problemen zu tun und auf der anderen Seite mit der Wahrnehmung, wie sie dann wahrgenommen wurde. Und dann entstand nach und nach, ich 
hoffe, ich komme jetzt, ja, jetzt. Eine Serie von den Zeichnungen, das ist von 2014 und das heißt My Beautiful Wife. Aquarelle gezeichnet auf den Formularen, die sie dann als Anträge für diese Heirat gestellt hat. Und das waren dann so Frauenakte, sie und ihre Frau mit glühenden Körperteilen, einerseits als Sinnlichkeit und andererseits als ähm, Erschöpfung von diesem ganzen Prozedere. Dann gab es so eine Serie von Porzellan mit diesem Körper und dann irgendwann hat sie ja sehr viele Formulare angesammelt von dieser Heirat. Die wurde dann auch annulliert irgendwann, später haben sie sich scheiden lassen. Und dann später, ein Jahr vor, zwei, äh, vor, dem, vor der russischen Aggression 2022, kamen, kamen sehr viele Formulare dazu dann von ihrem Refugee-Status dann in der Ukraine. Das sind diese hier und darauf hat sie sehr viele sinnliche Körper und Körperteile gemalt und gezeichnet. Sie war schwanger, sie erwartete ihr Kind und dann stand darauf, ich liebe dich nur einfach und kann man nicht nur glücklich sein und da waren sehr positive Messages drauf. Und kurz vor diesem Krieg wurde das Baby geboren und dann hat sich alles geändert. Maria musste 2022 dann äh, Exil im Ausland wieder suchen, wurde zum zweiten Mal Refugee, ging dann nach Linz, nach Österreich und hat dann wieder Anträge für Asyl ausgefüllt. Und darauf stand auch nichts mehr Sinnliches und auch nicht mehr einfach nur Erschöpfung. Diese ganzen Anträge hat sie ausgefüllt, nachdem die ganzen Verbrechen von Bucha passiert sind und von Irpin, von dem sie alle gehört haben. Und das hier ist jetzt eine Abbildung von einer Installation in Ebersberg. Das ist eine kleine Stadt in Bayern. Sie hat dann auf den Vorhängen praktisch diese Formulare ausgedruckt mit den Zeichnungen. Und das sieht so blutig aus und nicht mehr sinnlich. Darauf steht auf... Äh, Hört auf, unsere Frauen zu vergewaltigen. Darauf steht, wo ist mein Zuhause endlich? Und da sind ganz, ganz viele Anklagen gegenüber Russland. Also man sieht, dass es nach und nach sich verändert und brutal verändert mit diesem Krieg. Es gibt dann eine weitere Porzellanserie, bei der dann alles sich mischt. Diese Sinnlichkeit, dieses Blut, diese ganzen nochmal Exilformulare, die dann immer wieder und neu ausgefüllt werden. Und das ist einfach so eine geballte Anklage und Wut und ja auch ein Versuch, mit allem zurechtzukommen. So, und Maria ist dann in Linz und wir sind dann miteinander im Kontakt und diese Installation in Ebersberg kommt, weil wir dann miteinander kommunizieren und sie sucht Ausstellungsmöglichkeiten und ich werde angefragt, kann man denn ihre Arbeiten irgendwie bei uns auch zeigen in Ebersberg? Und dann gab es in München so eine ganz interessante Aktion mit einer Installation mit einem Tisch. Da hat man versucht, Geld zu sammeln für Projekte, für Medikamente in der Ukraine, junge Leute in einem Offspace. Und damit man mehr Geld sammelt, haben sie gesagt, kannst du uns jemand Bekannten mitbringen? Eine Künstlerin oder einen Künstler, der einfach viel Aufmerksamkeit auf sich zieht. Und da habe ich Maria gefragt, dürfen wir denn dein Porzellan ausstellen? Und das war die Zeit, als man schon erfahren hat, in Mariupol verhungern und verdursten die Menschen. Das kann doch nicht sein, dass man in Europa sowas erlebt. Und auf dieser Tafel ist natürlich nichts mehr Fröhliches. Das sind dann diese Teller und Tassen mit diesen Blumen, mit diesen Körperteilen, mit diesen Formularen und die bleiben leer und trocken. Und dann haben wir auf dem Tisch nochmal ganz kleine Skulpturen und das ist Porzellanmunition von einer anderen Künstlerin. Und das ist Julia Bileva. Julia war zu dem Zeitpunkt auch in Linz. Und das ist jemand, die ich kennengelernt habe über eine ganz tragische Geschichte. Am zweiten Tag des Krieges wurde die Familie von meiner ältesten Freundin erschossen. Von drei Kindern hat nur eins überlebt. Und ich wusste damals nicht, damit gut umzugehen. Die Bilder waren sogar in der Bildzeitung hier. Und Julia hat das Foto von den Kindern gepostet, weil sie so wütend war. Und sie wollte das einfach nur bekannt machen, was für Verbrechen es schon gleich am Anfang gegeben hat. Und ich habe sie damals nur gefragt, kennen Sie denn die Familie? Kannte sie nicht? Und so sind wir im Kontakt geblieben. Und als wir diese Tafel gedeckt haben mit dieser Anklage, wollte ich unbedingt diese Munition auf diesem Tisch haben. Und die haben wir ausgeliehen, diese Patronen, weil sie eigentlich für eine ganz andere Ausstellung geplant waren, hier in Berlin. 
Sie wurde geplant noch vor der Pandemie in der Galerie Quadrat bei Martin Quade. Martin ist heute auch da. Und dieser Krieg hat aber den Blick auf diese Ausstellung komplett geändert. Martin hat mich eingeladen, die zu kuratieren. Und Julia hat 800 von solchen Patronen herstellen lassen in Kiew, in einer Porzellanfabrik, die eine historische Bedeutung hat, auch für die ukrainische und die sowjetische Kunstgeschichte. Und diese Masse haben wir dann auf dem Boden der Galerie ausgebreitet und jeder kämpft mit seinen Waffen. Porzellan ist natürlich sehr fragil, aber auch kann extrem hart sein. Natürlich war das ein künstlerischer Waffenimport nach Deutschland an ein Land, das sehr lange auch äh, Waffenlieferungen an die Ukraine blockiert hat. Damals haben wir das nicht so hart formuliert, aber eigentlich war das so explizit, dass man das damals auch so nicht zu sagen gebraucht hat. Und diese Arbeit mit dem Porzellan ist bei Julia so, es ist ja extrem glatt, es ist so ästhetisch und die Inhalte sind aber so krass. Und ein neues Projekt, ich bin gleich am Schluss, wird gerade jetzt vorbereitet in Gmunden. Sie kennen vielleicht alle Gmundner Keramik, diese wunderschönen geflammten Teller. Und Julia macht in Gmunden jetzt äh, Kachelöfen mit Fliesen. Und Kachelöfen sind normalerweise etwas Dekoratives. Nur auf den Fliesen von Julia sind Porträts von den Menschen, die in Mariupol, in Asowstal ausgeharrt haben. Und das sind Porträts, die Sie bestimmt alle aus den Medien kennen. Und ähm, dieses unter anderem hier auch. Gerade da kommt eigentlich der Vergleich ganz gut, dass Porzellan sehr fragil ist, aber das kann auch sehr hart und resistent sein. Und man weiß inzwischen, wenn eine Rakete ein Haus zerstört, dann ist häufig das Einzige, was erhalten bleibt, ist ein Kachelofen. Hier haben wir einfach Fotos, die Julia auch für sich gesammelt hat, von den Kachelöfen, wo die Häuser einfach nicht mehr drumherum stehen. Und einige von ihren Kachelöfen werden so ähnlich aussehen, wie zerbombte Häuser nach dem Angriff. Die Ausstellung wird es äh, ab März geben und weitere Informationen werden wir gern dann Bescheid geben. Und das waren eigentlich die zwei Fälle, die ich Ihnen anschaulich machen wollte. Thank you very much. Uh, I must mention at this point when we were discussing the content of and the topics of our debate, uh, what I had in mind was to ask you to describe your and your colleagues' everyday struggle to react, not to stay silent towards the oppression and your ways to resist. But the fact that you're bringing over these two very powerful examples and you're speaking actually about the others, not about what you do, it tells everything. So thank you very much for the examples and the pictures. And actually it was Mariupol that was already mentioned, not once. And um, therefore I would like to turn into uh, Hannah. Okay, ah, thank you. Um, a person that went through this, that in person experienced uh, not only um, <clears throat> the great bravery and resilience of Ukrainians, but who herself is so brave and so resilient and expressed her resistance uh, by creating, by finishing the work that has been started by your co-director. And uh, I know that you also brought some materials with you and I propose so we start with them. Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, now it's working. Thank Perfect. you so much for being here. Yes, um, thank you for your words, but as um, I would say, we're always brave in someone's eyes. You know. Yeah, let's start with um, some extracts from Mariupolis 2 film. And we can, I can comment or answer questions. And yeah, let's start with that.
У нас есть комната, из комнат можно хорошо вообще увидеть. Ну, полностью руины. It was first extract, uh, beginning of the film, and um, uh, I was asked what the role of filmmaker to work in certain situation. Mm. I don't know what to say much what you seen actually, but um, I would start a bit from the beginning when we decided to go and it was more hard to be silent and it was more scare to observe or even not observe but this silence when you deaf like you don't hear the news or you don't hear how people in Mariupol are and uh, with my, my husband decided to go there and see and help and of course and most importantly made a movie and for us it was like first decision as a filmmakers we can't call call each other documentaries filmmakers if we want go and see by our own eyes what's happening, even though when city under the sage. But we still know that even though city blocked, that people remain, some, some of the people remain alive. And it was our first decision and yeah, I don't know what what you saw, what, how was the working condition there when like we would change with Mantas, like he would film, I would record sound or he would record sound, I would 
film from the uh, from the phone, let's say, from other perspectives, or not to film at all because um, the script was written by the bombs, by the shells. Uh, that it's important to add that uh, it was your return to Mariupol. It was Manta's return, but it was my first time. So it was. But all... yeah, I'm from Donbass area. I'm from Lugansk area, so I know what it means there. To be there. Yeah. To be there. Yeah. So uh, the decision to go back there, it was also a decision about continuing a process that has been started when the. Uh, uh, war started, yes, eight you, years ago. You know, it's not continuing, because we discussed with Mantas, it's a new, mm -hmm. uh, what, yes, it's a, not a new war, because war started eight, uh, years ago, but it's not the same as he, uh, Mantas Kvidaravichus did Mariupolis, it does not call first Mariupolis, but now it's like first part. But as and his idea was to uh, film uh, second, like con continuing to film or add something. And our dis discussion was about that it would be not the same film. It's a different film. It's a different situation. And yes, when we arrived there, of course, even for him being the second time it was like totally different Mariupol. Um, I want to say how really, how we really appreciate you coming over and sharing this very personal and painful experience of yours. Uh, but I'm also very um, oriented towards being able to see all these excerpts you so carefully were choosing for the panel. So let's get to the yeah. second one and then we continue. believe um, that for um, most maybe not uh, people here it would be strange why I choose this uh, scene to show right but for me it's um, great representation of a war to be honest um, because um, what I've been told 
from my grandmother, my grandparents, and uh, from the Second World War. Like, I heard about atrocities, I heard about people dying of hunger, and so on and so on, but no one told me one thing, that during that time, it was sweep a yard. And um, it is greatest representation of everyday life under certain circumstances, uh, making, uh, humanizing space within the time and doing everyday duty just to keep yourself alive, just to be a human. And that's what means for me this scene. Yeah, it's very powerful. The whole movie, it's uh, more than moving. And uh, I believe that it pictures much more. And also it's about absurdity of war. Like <laughs> in, uh, in five minutes, it's gonna be the same, right? Like, but still we sleep on the floor, like, and it is an absurdity, and that's what interesting and powerful for me in it. Who are those people? Because you spent some time there with the people you knew, or at least some of them you knew before. N now I, I know them. I hope that they're still alive. Yes, uh, some of them alive. Yes, but they, from Mariupol, they are local people. Let's move forward to the third example or excerpt. Да, я пошел, открыл калитку. Где кухня завалена? Да? Ну, вот, глянь. Прямо мина попала во фронтон. Вот это да, вот это. А, дом он. А это внизу двери. Он аварийный был, они его бросили. Он же, видишь, весь на стяжках. А мой дом вот тут дальше. О, там соли у тебя нет? Соли? Соли у нас кончается. Да, если раскапать, то ее не раскапать. Вот это вот дом был. Вот это моя крупная была, веранда была. Это все прошло. А вот там авиабомба упала. Вот это семь домов снесло авиабомбой. Семь домов, ты не считая гаражей. А в один дом попали точно и улетел. А вот. это когда яма? Это, это на крыше? Да, шла? да, на крыше. Это и... первая была бомба. Да. И, и, это 4, 4 марта, пол одиннадцатого вечера. Можем туда пройти, подняться. А дров сколько, да? Теперь? Да, дров. И в тайгу не надо ехать. И дома моего. А вон, видишь, где авиабомба упала. Вот. Вот все, в округе разрушено. Вот это был дом. Это все засыпало с этой ямы. Вот. Так что... Так что вот так. так вот такая ситуация. 32 года отработал день в день. И на старость остался нищим. Напрашивается вопрос, я кем работал? Вот так. Вот такая ситуация у меня. Без выходного. Вот это он тоже один дом, вот второй дом был. Это от этой бомбы. От этой бомбы. Вот глубина ее, я не знаю сколько. Метров 15, наверное. 15 не будет, но 10 будет. Ну, 10. И в диаметре, наверное, метров 20-30. Да. 
Они наелись, они уже, я вчера да. приходил, да, они не, не сильно голодные. А так они реагируют, да? Да, они сразу летят. На этот звук, да? Да, Еще да, раз. да, да. Кто-то на свист зовет, ну, так по, по, по привычке. Он из кухни, ее нужно полностью перекладывать, она вся лопнутая. Так что все побито, жить негде. Я рассчитывал, думаю, до этой мины, думаю, подремонтирую, перейду в кухню, а тут потом уже буду заниматься по ходу, а сейчас убрал туда. А то пожар, да, а то в комнате в конце, отсюда вот. А то пожар был 100%. Тут... Ну тут в чердаке жили голуби, пока мина не пролетела. Ну, ничего. Прилично у тебя, да? Так, прилично, их было 300 штук. Ох, да. А это осталось 20 штук, это что, прилично? Это так. А это пролетело 21 марта мина. А дом 4 марта. Второй город в мире по чистоте экологической чистый. Да, да, он супер чистый. Он да. Вот это он все, я запомнил. Когда он последний раз проезжал, мы в Колыбе с ним посидели, поговорили, и он поехал. Ну, мы с ним с детства в одном классе учились, вместе выросли. Так что... Так что вот такая ситуация. Мы с ним одногодки. Занимался все. Птицы занимался. Он. Эйш. Попугаи были. Вот и все. Вот и все закончилось. 4 марта. Ну хоть ушли отсюда. Весь металл залетел в чердак туда. И э, веранда тоже покрытая была металлом. Поэтому возгорание не получилось. Я закрываю, чтобы меньше тут мародеров лазить. Конечно. Why did you why did you choose this part? I guess we can talk a lot about each each part in this part, right? It's um the first like what I'm still laughing and I laughing all the time when you don't have a house but you sh someone short on salt <laughs> you will, would ask do you have any salt <laughs> right and it's very cultural it's uh, cultural level as well um, as like as well covers all our system where we live um, of capitalism, where you work in 32 years, and for what? Also, for what? Now, at least 20 pigeons alive, and you can take care of them. But, yeah, also, the last scene um, where people, where the gates still remain on the place, It's a duty to close them, even though it's like nothing to take, even assault. You have completed uh, the movie some time ago. You have already shown it several times. It's been awarded. Congratulations on that. Thank you. What were the reactions 
to this documentary. Yeah, reactions is different, and uh, because it's not uh, just about the documentary itself, but also the main, I would call Manta Skvidaravich's main protagonist on this film. You heard his voice, mm, them, and because he uh, st he remained unfortunately in the film. And uh, I left his voice, his interaction with people, even though it's uh, grammatically incorrect in filmmaking to do that, to hear director's voice or direct, see director's shadow. But um, I consider him uh, as a protagonist. So this film, it's my voice um, to talk about all people alive and dead. Also, to question some, um, to question absurdity of this war. Uh, also, to bring this vis invisible to the visible, as Mantas like to say. It. And of course, um, one I would sometimes I would be asked like Anna, but aren't you pro-Russian? And I would say, like, my position, I guess, very clear in this film, but because I'm not, I'm still, uh, I'm supporting a life of people and show everyday life of people, I could be blamed. And for someone might not be, unfortunately, not be clear which side I support politically, but I believe that my position is very clear and uh, yes, Russia invaded Ukraine, but the life still remain there. And I guess, yeah. And then of course people would cry and I very happy when people can laugh about these absurd jokes but it's also part of their life, for what I proud. I'm not sure if we have enough time to see the last one, and considering Janine's reaction, definitely not. Um, so if you won't mind, I would like to just turn uh, us to you, to the audience. Uh, you are aware of the great challenge of the topic and the panel, of the great load of expertise and the great value of the examples and personal examples, um, of the great courage to tackle uh, from the philosophical point of view the greatest questions and uh, uh, <clears throat> that the humanity is facing, our societies are facing. It's now to <laughs> time to wrap up, sorry for that. We had an insight from the meta perspective. We had an insight from the country that actually is in peace and almost in prosperity. We had an insight from the sector that was supposed to enhance creativity but is helping to survive the creators and curators. And eventually this great testimony uh, and the great examples of the movie I recommend you all to watch. What would be your questions and your reactions? We are looking forward to that now. Please use microphone and introduce yeah. yourself. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, <coughs> I'm Mary Klaassen, I live here, I have an art portal. <coughs> so what I'm, uh, my question to all of you would be, um, because this is uh, uh, so sensitive, it's especially the weeping and the, the sculpture out of uh, soap that was a target. And also the example from uh, Hungary. And uh, so is this a trend? Maybe a question to the philosopher or to all of you. So is this going to remain um, this sort of 
trend of oppressing others and uh, with the means of war, maybe. So we will come, will we see more, more radical in Poland, Hungary, or wherever? So uh, this was, would be my question. Could you handle it? Whether we can, whether we can expect it to continue and we don't know. I'm yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, the, the, this is a crucial uh, question, but uh, of course, I don't know if we have uh, answer uh, to it. Uh, I would say that uh, again. I mean, my personal memories is that in 1990, when uh, Eastern Europe get rid of uh, this uh, system, communist uh, system, we all were very optimistic. And uh, uh, now we have in Poland and in Hungary what we have. So we have less and more uh, soft uh, oppression. But anyway, this oppression is uh, it's terrible in the sense what uh, you said, that, for instance, I have uh, colleagues, friends, but, you know, they all are uh, dependent on uh, finance from, um, you know, from uh, government. Uh, and they don't, uh, they, they don't decide to tackle certain things. So it is like to stay away to stay away, not to be against, not to be for, and so on, but to stay away and then we can get. But uh, uh, what about uh, future? I mean, I personally believe, and I think that there are uh, several proofs that uh, finally democratic society can be established. It is uh, also my uh, personal experience. So I wouldn't say that it is the trend of oppression as kind of a decisive uh, trend. I would say rather that we should think about uh, better uh, future. Thank you, Leszek, uh, uh, to show us some <laughs> light in a tunnel. Uh, although I would love to hear more maybe later on about the arguments behind yeah. this optimism. <laughs> uh, that would be interesting. But maybe there are some more questions and comments. Please do. Uh, thank you for the panel. Just a, a short question to anyone who wants to, to reply. Do you think that the situation of migrants going to Poland and Hungary from Ukraine might help from your perspective, to mitigate the political oppression inside those countries or to make it weaker, the support that still exists to the governments of each country? Do you think this is an, a, a possibility? Well, I think that the Hungarian government is very, very confused uh, about the situation in Ukraine. It's least to say. Uh, because before the start of the war, uh, our government was like really openly Russian and, and Putin friendly. And uh, when the war started, it was like a week before the local Hungarian election. And it was clear that they needed to come up with some new communication idea because going with the Russians was not an option anymore. And uh, they had like a week to change their whole communication and propaganda system about Russia right before the election. And they came up with the, the simplest and at the same time the best marketing idea because they asked the voters, do you want war or peace? The simplest one. If you vote for the government, you get the peace. If you vote for the opposition side, you get the war. Hungary will be involved in the war. And they win, they won huge. Like, it was amazing. And the other part of the confusion was, was about uh, the question of migrants, because uh, Hungary, ever since uh, the 2014 uh, migrant crisis, were, was against uh, migration. It was very clear 
from the very beginning. And this time, in Ukraine, there's a war right next to us. It's very, very hard to say no uh, to migrants. And because many of those migrants are Hungarians, because there's a Hungarian minority in Ukraine. So how do you say no to migrants from a war country right next to your door who are also Hungarians? So it's, it's obviously, it's, it's impossible. So uh, if it would not be that very, very tragic and sad situation, it would have been uh, a nice thing to say, nice thing to see the confusion uh, of the government. But nowadays I mostly see the tragic uh, part of it, that, that how thin uh, is, is the moral behind the decisions uh, of, our, of our government. Maybe I will add to that, uh, referring to the Polish situation. I would say that the great number of uh, uh, war refugees from Ukraine worked in favor of institutionalization, further institutionalization of the government uh, for three reasons. First of all, as you probably are aware of, <clears throat> the first month, even more, six weeks of organizing ourselves and the first humanitarian reactions, aid, assistance, was uh, fully covered by the grassroots movements, individuals, small business, and local, uh, local governments. Big cities of three, maybe four, uh, of Polish regions, voivodenships. Uh, eventually, it proved to be successful until the day I believe that, it's, that it is. But it helped the government to capitalize on that. For example, in reopening their international channels of communication that beforehand were closed because of their openly uh, anti-immigrant attitude and praxis. Uh, another thing worth mentioning is that, um, is that um, central government and migration um, they haven't changed much in a sense of the long-term strategy of how to handle the topic of forced migration and mass inflow of, of uh, refugees. We've seen some amendments, we see some new laws introduced, but in principle, in the systemic sense, a lot has changed within Poland, within the attitudes of Poles, not the system to be changed. Um, and of course, there is this particular aspect of, uh, <clears throat> of uh, the Polish relation or the Polish government relation with the EU. Some of you maybe remember that prior to the escalation of the war in uh, Ukraine, there was and there is still a humanitarian crisis at the Polish border with Belarus, where other types of forced migrants, of immigrants, of war refugees were not taken in, were pushed back, and until the day they are still pushed back. Although some of the Polish, um, some of the Polish judges, some of the Polish um, uh, judiciary system uh, already officially said that it was illegal, that the orders coming from the top to the local officers was illegal. But what had happened uh, down uh, at the border with Ukraine helped to some extent to cover up these pitfalls, these misdoings, uh, violation of human rights that is happening towards non-Ukrainian refugees. The closest example, just to conclude, would be how Poland uh, still treats the Belarusian uh, refugees, the double refugees. So it's, it's not equal. Um, Dominika, I just wanted to come back to the title of this panel, which is Artistic Freedom Between Repression and Resistance. 
and we have heard from Hungary how inside of the repression you're still fighting to have a voice. We have heard a wonderful poem by Cecile trying to find words to describe. This is what we can do, what the alliance of us can do is talk about how we resist with art. How we, the, the uh, analysis of the political situation is necessary, but we can do, what we can do is look at these incredible images of uh, uh, the statues that we saw, as these Im images of this film uh, of Manta and, and Hannah, in which suddenly you realize the necessity of protecting the voice, protecting the voice that is going to carry the, this kind of truth, and how far can we as Alliance protect those voices and keep going on telling the stories in images, in architecture, in, in, in uh, um, different ways, in different artistic ways. But I think that uh, maybe the way to understand what we are going through is less the political analysis, but the analysis, how can we protect these voices, the artistic voices that are there and are um, being threatened in the case of, sure enough, in the cases that we've heard about. Thank you very much, Janine, for the voice and for, the, for that comment. Uh, do we have anyone else who wanted to add to that? We are slowly wrapping up. There is one, so let it be the last one. And then we go for a break. Hello, um, thank you. So um, I just have a short question. Um, and uh, this is how big is the importance for you also to work in these times of war together with Russian artists? Because of course what the government is doing is cruel, but how important is this in this time also especially to work together with, with the Russian artists uh, Ukraine and Russian together. So, um, yeah. Is there, you think it's for freedom or against freedom? So, uh, yeah. <laughs> Maybe. Please do. You know, it depends on the perspective. How do you get people together? Because, uh, as for me, I know some Russians which are really suffering under that pressure. And they are definitely against the current regime. And uh, there are not many, I know, to tell the truth. And I appreciate their work very much. I uh, also have some colleagues from the museums which are extremely helpful. Um, they are organizing help for Ukrainian museums. The one is here in uh, Berlin, it's uh, Museum Karlshorst. They even renamed themselves after the beginning of that invasion, of that full-scale invasion. And those are the cases uh, about which we are actually, we were waiting for it. Because, you know, that silence from the Russian side, even if they are against Putin, is a little bit... Um, mm, maybe irritating, uh, at least, because they say, we are not many and we are maybe afraid to get arrested, to get punished, to get tortured and so on. And then there was something what began with Iran. And you see Iranians demonstrating in Europe, not in Iran. Uh, they are also at the bigger scale, but here in Germany, in Austria, in Italy, almost every day and they are demonstrating against uh, the regime in Iran. I haven't seen those demonstrations so many from Russians. There are not so many cases. And I think under that point, uh, it's not actually on Ukrainians to invite the Russians to that collaborations, and it's not on Germans to try to make that appeasement. It's maybe um, just berechtigt for the Ukrainian colleagues to selber zu entscheiden und vielleicht auch einfach mal Abstand haben zu dürfen. 
Und ich glaube, da würde keiner Ja oder Nein sagen. Das hängt sehr stark von der konkreten Situation ab. Und das dürfen die ukrainischen Kollegen tatsächlich auch mal für sich entscheiden. Also ich glaube, das ist so mein Plädoyer, dass man das nicht erzwingen sollte. Weil diese Frage hängt sehr oft und sehr schwer im Raum und die ist sehr schwer zu beantworten. Thank you very much. Olena Talun, Hanna Bilobrova, Leszek Kotranowicz, Ferenc Cinki and voiceless Dominika Kasprowicz. <laughs> Thank you very much.